what is the first sound phone? Now, if this question were asked in a film history class, any good film history student would say the jazz singer. And basically any professor would probably say correct. But the myth that the jazz singer is the first sound film is so widespread that even film historians might not be aware of the true first sound film. A film like last year's Babylon would have you believe that the film industry turned on its head overnight with the release of this film. The idea that a musical film was the first to make use of sound film technology and that it instantly transformed the silent film industry is an appealing one, but the truth is far stranger. There were a few films before The Jazz Singer which used recorded sound, the most significant of which was 1926's Don Juan, which was released one year before The Jazz Singer. But that film did not even contain spoken dialogue. For a few years, the industry was making films that used recorded sound, but only for synchronized scores and sound effects. With the jazz singer came the invention of the part talkie, as it would still be a few more years until sound films would take their proper form as talkies, or feature films which had spoken dialogue all the way through, and not just in select sequences. Yet over 10 years before the jazz singer of Don Juan, there was the photodrama of creation in 1914. This behemoth of a film was over eight hours long and was made by an organization called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. For those who aren't especially familiar with the Jehovah's Witnesses, this is the organization that is behind most of their activities today. Yet, it is not quite accurate to describe the film as made by the Jehovah's Witnesses. There really was no group which referred to itself as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Back then, there was something called the Bible Student Movement. Without getting into the complicated history of it all, within this broader movement, there have been several schisms. But no matter which branch of the Bible students or Jehovah's Witnesses we are talking about, they all trace their roots back to one man in particular, Charles Taze Russell. The photodrama is not only highly significant in the technical history of the cinema, but is also of great importance to the development and success of Russell's cult. But what of the film itself? What does this eight-hour early sound cult film really look like? God's glory in the heavens. The reverence of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom. Only the foolish say in their heart, there is no God. Day unto day uttered a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. The presentation of the photodrama the is utterly unique. To call it simply a film can be misleading, as alongside the film sections, the photodrama was presented originally with extensive recorded lectures accompanied with magic lantern slides. But what exactly are these magic lantern slides? While the medium of the magic lantern is typically considered pre-cinema, seeing as it resembles the cinema in certain regards, um, but it can also be considered completely distinct from it, and it uses something which kind of resembles a film projector. It was invented in the 17th century and was popular for several centuries after, both as a public spectacle and as a toy. The magic lantern worked by projecting light through hand-painted glass slides called lantern slides. I would say that regardless of the film's content, the glass slides are quite beautiful to look at. And they might almost convince you to watch the film. Almost. I mean, this thing is very long and... His speeches are very, very dry, so <laughs> I'm not sure I recommend actually watching it. In the early film era, it was actually relatively common to combine magic lantern slides and projected motion picture film. What made the photodrama technically innovative was its usage of sound. Early sound film was most often done by way of a recording horn, which built off the technology of the photograph. Such systems were first pioneered by inventors like Thomas Edison. However, none of this technology was used for feature-length talkie productions. Systems such as Edison's 
utilized pulleys in order to keep the record in sync with the phone projector. The photodrama used phonograph records, and likely kept it in sync using a similar method. Although I cannot find any documentation explaining what system they used beyond the fact that it involved recorded discs. It might seem easy enough to keep a lecture in sync with Magic Lantern slides, as you simply manually paste the slides with the spoken dialogue. However, as I've mentioned previously, the photodrama also had something like short films within it, with recorded soundtracks, one of which even contained synced singing. I cannot overstate how revolutionary this was for the time. To put this in perspective, let me remind you that it wouldn't be until 10 years later that a film named Don Juan premiered with synced sound, and the sound in question was the dialogueless clinking of swords. Capernaum cast down to hell. In its eight hours, the photodrama attempts to cover all of the Bible, human history, and the forthcoming end of the world. A key to understanding Charles Taze Russell's narrative of history is his unique version of dispensationalism. And by dispensationalism, I mean the belief that history has clear eras or dispensations which correspond to biblical prophecies. The seven days of creation correspond not to seven day-night cycles, but to 49,000 years, each day being 7,000 years long. The film claims that we are now living in the seventh day, specifically the last 1,000 years, which will be the apocalyptic eschaton. So the film is structured around each of those days. And it was through this bizarre reinterpretation of scripture that Charles Taze Russell was able to convince people that the end of the world was imminent. It's important to consider that one of the main selling points of the photodrama was to claim that it reconciled faith and science, and its technical innovations likely helped its audience believe that they were seeing some kind of awe-inspiring new approach to scripture in which the inventions and discoveries of modern society would help shed light on ancient, secret truths. Much like the Christian science movement, we can see one of the best ways to start a cult is not to claim to reject modernity, but to claim to reconcile it with religion. The screenings were entirely free to attend. This was key to the film's success. The premise that the film reconciled history, science, and the Bible featured technical spectacle and was accessible to anyone essentially guaranteed that it would reach massive audiences. Of course, it is important to acknowledge that although the film was free to view, it was certainly not free to produce. It costed the Bible students some $300,000, which if we adjust for inflation in 2023, should come out to about $9,300,000. Even at this point, Russell's cult was clearly a profitable enterprise. The film's free screenings attracted over 9 million audience members in the first year alone, and had screenings in North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. The outreach caused by the film was spectacular, and can claim no small part in the Bible student's explosive growth. The photodrama premiered in 1914, only two years before Russell's death. Soon after the movement's founder died, the group underwent a crisis of leadership. Joseph Rutherford was elected president of the Watchtower Society soon after Russell's death, but his leadership was soon protested by many, and his rule was described by his detractors as autocratic. The movement split off into two main groups at this point, although there is plenty more splintering and breakoff groups. The Associated Bible Students, who rejected Rutherford and continued to follow Russell's teaching, and the Jehovah's Witnesses, led by Rutherford, and eventually diverging drastically from Russell's theology. The Jehovah's Witnesses have great power today as an organization, and it is them who control the public memory of the photodrama creation. The memory of a film, whether it remains in the public consciousness or is forgotten, is largely determined by the location and condition of the original film prints. Luther Zwingli Melanchthon. The film survives 
largely in two versions. One is publicly available, claims to be complete, and appears to be distributed by the Associated Bible Students. The other is not publicly viewable, is still being reconstructed and restored, and is under the control and ownership of the Watchtower or the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Associated Bible Students version was largely reconstructed by a lone amateur archivist. Despite his willingness to share his reconstructions freely online, he seems to try to keep his identity relatively anonymous, so we won't mention it here. Just know that if you find the film online, the version you are watching was surely made by him. The restoration was done over the course of decades, with the bulk of the work beginning in the early 1980s. He collected lantern slides, film reels, and photograph records from various sources, and attempted to duplicate and scan the film with various amateur methods. With his makeshift techniques, he has sadly damaged and destroyed sections of the film, and due to the various methods used over the course of many decades, the quote-unquote HD restored version on YouTube contains wildly varying quality. While the Magic Lantern slides have been captured with impressive resolution, the film sections are in terrible quality and it often are uh, digitally compressed video scans of the original film reels. He has uploaded a video documenting his remaking of the film, and while I admire his determination to preserve such a film, as someone who is receiving his training in film preservation, I find his techniques to be absolutely horrific. For me, the story of this restoration is essentially a cautionary tale of film preservation gone wrong, and it demonstrates how you need far more than just good intentions in order to effectively preserve history. I mean, I really... I, I can't even look at these pictures of him using a video camera and duct taping it to a film projector, and I just, I can't help but cringe. It's so painful to look at. The Jehovah's Witnesses version of the film is not publicly documented much at all. It is clear that the Watchtower organization has held onto the original film prints, presumably since the film's original run, yet has not officially released them or restored them yet. While not too much can be said about this, we can see in the George Eastman Museum's publicly viewable documentations of their collections, they have holdings of film reels and phonograph records. We can see that they have a 35mm Nitrate Master positive. We can hope that this means that they'll eventually do a restoration using actual archival standards, but at this point we can only really hope for that. But why, if this film has had such colossal importance, has it not been more prominently distributed and promoted by the Jehovah's Witnesses? And why does it seem to be forgotten by film historians and the public alike? Could it be that there are reasons why the Jehovah's Witnesses don't want the film to be that well known? The answer is sort of. As in, they would like the film and its achievements to be well known, but they would seem to prefer if the film itself was not that well viewed. This is due to the lack of consistency between modern Jehovah's Witnesses teaching and the teaching of their founder, Charles Taze Russell. The Jehovah's Witnesses are a Christian restorationist movement alongside the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists, as they claim they alone have authority, and that this authority comes from a lineage beginning with Jesus and leading to Russell and his inheritors. Now this of course implies some kind of eternality and consistency in the organization's teachings. But when this film is viewed by a modern Jehovah's Witness, they will notice glaring differences, as the YouTube comments can demonstrate for us. Let's take the crucifixion, for example. Christians, historians, and the general populace all agree that Jesus' crucifixion on a cross was essentially a historical fact, and it is treated as such in the photodrama. But the Jehovah's Witnesses actually deny this historical fact, and instead, they insist, much to the surprise of all other groups, that Jesus was crucified not on a cross, but on a torture stake. We can see comments confused by why Charles Taze Russell would teach that Jesus was crucified on a cross, when it is clear that in their Bibles, which have the New World Translation used exclusively by the Jehovah's Witnesses, it says that Jesus was crucified on a torture stake. Why is it that the founder of the One true authoritative organization would contradict its own teaching. 
Other examples in the photodrama abound, but this can point us towards the reasons why the Watchtower might have decided to keep the photodrama a bit unseen for so many years. It seems that the photodrama is actually relatively well known among Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's not often viewed by them. And this is due to the fact that the organization props up the achievements, and they have all these articles on their website describing how great the film is, but they don't link to the film or tell you where to access it. So the Jehovah's Witnesses strategy seems to be that we will, you know, continue to talk about the achievements, but as long as nobody actually sees the film, that we don't have to worry about addressing these past beliefs that our founder held. Also, it should be noted that the cost and time required to restore any film is a large expense. And to restore one of the longest films ever, again, this film is eight hours long, it would be quite the colossal undertaking for anyone. And that alone should explain some of the photodrama's hiddenness over the years. Also, is it too much of an assumption to say that there is a sort of bias working in the other direction, which also aims to keep the photodrama hidden in its own way? What I mean here is film critics and film historians who surely have heard of the photodrama, but they just kind of don't really mention it, and they keep a distance from it, and they don't want to give it credit as the first sound feature film, because it's sort of an awkward truth, right? What we can learn from the story of this film is that it's important to preserve things not only for the sake of film history or for history in general, but because organizations like cults want to keep information hidden. It is to their advantage to keep it hidden. I hope this film is watched by film scholars and Jehovah's Witnesses alike, as I think it can give them a good idea of where the religious tradition actually came from, and also, possibly, where it might be leading them. As God made not the earth in vain, but to be inhabited, this same principle doubtless applies to the other planets of our solar system, and to one thousand millions of other worlds, of which astronomy tells us. They are all to be people, and the things learned in the sin experience of our earth are to be their instructions.